Hello and welcome to Pride of Portsmouth, the go-to place on Portsmouth and its history. My name's Kyle. And I'm Ollie. On today's show we'll be looking at one of the most influential figures of Portsmouth and educating you on his input in this historical city. Yes, and throughout the show we'll be asking you to tweet us whether it's a question you may have on today's subject. Or even if you're just enjoying the show, just let us know by tweeting at Pride of Portsmouth. And there's the screen, it's on the TV now, that's what we look like. And now as citizens of Portsmouth, uh, we spend every day in this fine city, surrounded by an area with a deep, rich history. Yes, from the cobbled streets of Old Portsmouth to the ward-ridden Guildhall. Wherever you go, you're bound to encounter something with a profound historical account. And there's one man whose name comes up, in particular, when thinking about the contributions to Portsmouth. He is known as the father of Southsea and was a major influence on this city. During the Victorian ages, we are, of course, talking about Thomas Ellis Owen. Yes, we are. But Ollie, how many people do you actually think know about him? Oh, I don't know, but we went out to find out. Uh, do you know who the father of Southsea is? No. Thomas Ellis Owen? No, I never heard of him. No. Never heard of him. Father of Southsea? Father of Southsea, I haven't heard of him, no. Uh, no. Thomas Ellis Owen, ring any bells? Who? Thomas Ellis Owen. No. Father of Southsea, never heard of him? Nope. Thomas Ellis Owen, ring any bells? No. Not at all? Not at all. No. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Perfect. No. Father of Salsi, never heard of him? No. Alright, brilliant. Thank you. Perfect. No. Father of Salsi, not heard of him? No. Alright, thank you. So, I noticed, out of every single person you asked there, <laughs> not one of them knew about the father of Southsea. Literally. We mentioned his name, we mentioned the father of Southsea, <laughs> just not one person knew. Oh, yeah, it's quite surprising they didn't know about such a Southsea 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 Southsea. Uh, It seems that way, but it's good news for us because today's show will educate you a little bit about what Owen did for the people of Portsmouth. But before we jump into what he did for us, I thought it would be a good idea for us to get a bit more information about him. So let's give you guys a question and let's see what else he has done. When did Thomas Ellis Owen come to Portsmouth? Was it in the 1820s? In the 1830s? Or the 1840s? What you can go with? Uh, random guess. I'm going to go for 1840s. OK. Um, I'm going to do the other end of the scale, and I'm going to go for 1820s. Come on, 1820s. What's the answer? Yes! 1-0 to you. Ah, 1-0 <laughs> to me. Come on. OK, uh, we're now going to go speak to someone called Sue, a lovely lady, and find out what she's been up to in, with her involvement with Thomas Ellis Owen. He was a family man and he only ever had one child and shortly before, shortly after she was born, he, his family, um, which consisted of his parents and um, 12 brothers and sisters, um, they moved to Dublin. M most of the brothers and sisters went to Dublin with the parents. Um, and I, I think that kind of left alone, he probably knew by that time that perhaps he wasn't going to have any more children and he if you think about it, he'd been surrounded by um, people, really, all his life, with, with, with that big family. And um, probably he was kind of left alone with his wife and his child. And I think he, it kind of motivated him, really, this, this kind of feeling of family, really, motivated him to then go on and develop Southsea. I think that's why, how come he had the energy. I think if he'd had loads of children, probably he wouldn't have gone on to do that but I think because of the way he was because he was a student he was hard working and he was a family man probably that was how it came about really well Southsea wouldn't have been because it wouldn't have had its lovely windy lanes and it wouldn't have had the pretty bits I don't think and because he did introduce lots of gardens you know he when he built he built on the corner of plots so his, so there would be lots of um, space in front of the house to make it look more grand and it's it, it, on a fairly small site and he would do pl he planted lots of trees so if you think about central south sea there are lots of l green trees and it's very leafy and pretty i think really it was laying out was laying out south sea really i think it was really because um he did build an awful lot of houses in south sea he did he was a town planner he built he designed the roads 
he designed the kind of structure of Southsea. When Southsea start first came into being, I mean, it was a kind of just a swampy kind of. Um, it had a few market gardens and farms. It was there were cattle tracks and things. It, it was really the kind. Uh, thank you to the wonderful Sue Pike there. Uh, the official author of the official Thomas Ellison book. A uh, very knowledgeable woman. She is, and did you see the cat sat on the sofa behind her? We need <laughs> one for our sofa. Fast asleep, <laughs> wasn't he? It was throughout the entire meeting. <laughs> and uh, we'll be back to find out a bit more about Owen a little later in the show. Now, Carl, we know how um, Owen helped develop Southsea, but is there anything else you think we ought to know? Yeah, there's lots of things. Uh, I can tell you now, it wasn't just Southsea Owen's involved in, but to make it a bit more interesting, uh, I've got a little quiz to test your nose. Are you ready? I love quizzes. I'm a bit competitive. Just, just <laughs> warning you now, but I think I know enough to give you a good money for, uh, oh, good run for your money. Let's find out. Uh, he was known as the father of Southsea. Do you know why he earned that title? Yeah, I think if I remember right, he, I read somewhere that Southsea used to be a um, farmland, which he worked to change into a garden suburb um, with houses for the growing population. Is that right? I it think is that's right. Spot on. Uh, can you name any building of note he designed in Southsea? <laughs> yeah, that's easy. Um, <laughs> St Jude's Church. It's right in the centre of Southsea. I also know that he built a lot of the buildings around it, and the only reason he built the church was so that he could sell them, because obviously there's a church, the houses become more valuable and more appealing to the locals, and obviously the place will get richer. So he built them for that. And I also happen to know that he managed to, uh, well, he designed a number of the civic centres and commercial buildings that we see all over the place. <laughs> that is impressive, even I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know where else nearby he might have worked? Um, I think he did some work in Gosport. Is that yeah, right? Gosport? spot on again. And Owen didn't just stay in Hampshire, he designed a number of projects all over the country, but do you know where? Um, I know he did some work on a vicarage somewhere in Shropshire, um, but I don't know of any other work that he did elsewhere. You've come up chance, Ollie. Uh, again, you're along the right line. Uh, he did do some work in a vicarage in pre-Shropshire, as you mentioned, but he also worked on projects all over the country in places such as Dorset and Pembrokeshire. That's amazing. So we can see that Owen was actually a very busy man. He may not have done much outside of Portsmouth, but actually, influence a lot of other places as well. Yeah, you could say that. Uh, but I think we should take a further look at what else, he did, what else he did here in Portsmouth. So we've got another question to test your knowledge. And let's take a look at some of the architecture Owen was involved in too. What are the first names of Thomas Ellis Owen's parents? Were they Jacob and Mary, James and Louise, or Martin and Amanda? I'm going to go uh, for Martin and Amanda. I, I'm going to get a logical guess and okay. go for Jacob and Mary. They're quite traditional English names. Okay, so let's see who the winner is. Who's won this one? Oh. Yeah, Equalizer. Back oh. in the game. One all, one all. It's all on the last question, which is coming up a little bit later in the show. Uh, but now let's go to St. Jude's Church. I went up to go and catch up with a guy called David who talked to us about the architecture that Thomas Ellis Owen was involved in. Hello, I'm Ollie from Pride of Portsmouth, and here we are in St Jude's Church in Southsea, one of Owen's more significant contributions to Portsmouth. Owen is perhaps best known for his work in this area of Portsmouth. He directly took in the creation of over 150 houses in the Southsea area. In fact, one of Owen's houses just outside this church was owned by another famous Portsmouth citizen, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. I'm joined here at St Jude's Church with uh, David, who knows a lot more about Sir Thomas Ellis Owen than I do. And you tell us what you know about this church that we're in. All oh, right, uh, thank you. Um, well, the church was originally built in 1851. Um, it was bu built by Thomas Ellis Owen uh, because he couldn't sell his houses that he had built. And his brother was the vicar of St Jude's in Chelsea in London. And his brother said to him, if you build a church, people will think this will beca become an affluent area and they'll want to buy your houses. So he did. He built the church quite badly, actually. Not very well s built at all. But anyway, he built the church uh, and then sold his houses and made an awful lot of money, became rich, affluent, and quite successful as an architect. Shortly after, um, his daughter married a priest from Petersville, just up the road, and he became the first incumbent, the first vicar. Uh, so he kept it in the family. And if you look at the windows over there, you'll see that the windows are dedicated to his father in 1875. Uh, going on from that, the church had many different sort of makeovers and changed quite radically over the years um, to what you see it now. 
we see we've got a gallery mm. here inside the church. Tell us mm. a bit about why, why we have that in there, because obviously not many churches we've seen these days have them. No, no, indeed. And originally the gallery wasn't part of the church design. Uh, it was just one single floor with pews in. Uh, but the story goes that um, the good people of Sancy who were coming to St. George were quite affluent and wealthy, well-to-do. There were servants at home, and the good people thought the servants should go to church because it would be good for them. Uh, so they thought, we need more space. Where are we going to put them? Actually, we don't want them sitting with us. We'll put them up in the gallery. So they built the gallery all the way around on three sides. That's why the window at the back is split. You can only see a very little bit of the bottom and a large bit of the top. Uh, so the galleries were built with separate entrances, so the servants wouldn't come in with the rich and wealthy, but would come in by themselves. Uh, they would sit upstairs, and the good people would sit downstairs. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for talking to us. Um, we'll go and have a look around and see what else we can find. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. What does this represent inside the church? Well, this is the Lanyon Memorial, and it was... Uh, built in hmm, 1890, that sort of time, and it represents a memorial to the Lanyon family, which is all rather sad because uh, the, the wife, Florence, who was the wife of the colonel, she died in childbirth, he died a few years later in, Lon in New York, and they brought him back and put him in a cemetery in London with his wife, and it also uh, celebrates the life of Herbert Miles the Lan Lanyon, who was a midshipman who died at the tender age of 16. Uh, and he was the son of Herbert, who was the brother of Lanyon. So it's a, it's a the Lanyon memorial. It's all rather sad in terms of early death. But I particularly like her, her hands. I think her hands are rather beautiful. Uh, some fantastic clips there, Ali. You really like, you enjoyed yourself. I really did. And speaking to David was such a pleasure. If you're watching David, thank you so much for talking to us. He told us stuff like... Um, Thomas Erosoyan, the original plans of the St. Jude's Church didn't include the spire that we'll see today. And what, um, what he did, they, well, they created the spire for the Navy so that when the naval ships were coming back into Portsmouth, they could use it as a way of navigating back into the port. It's fantastic. It's very there's, fascinating. <laughs> there's also a plaque as well, which David was telling us about, um, that was left by um, Queen Victoria. Now, they don't, they don't have any proof that Queen Victoria was there. Mm. Um, but they seem to think she was because they, well, there would be a, a plaque there and also the roads next to St. Jude's Church they're all called like Queen's Crescent and Queen's Road so um, yeah. again I, I mean David told, told us all that so thank you again uh, anyway so we see a lot of Owen's work around Portsmouth but what don't we see Carl? Uh, what, what do you mean? Pigs <laughs> what? well Portsmouth is clean isn't it? I guess so. Yeah, that might have not been the case without Owen. He backed the Public Health Act of 1848, which made Portsmouth and other um, parts of Britain clear of various unhygienic things, such as human waste product, rubbish, and even pigs running about the streets. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I couldn't imagine being around <laughs> those times, no. Uh, yes, Owen's involvement in many political activities saw him become a rather renowned politician. In fact, it became so much so that in 1847, he got voted Mayor of Portsmouth. During his first year as mayor, Owen was associated with a number of events from the beginning of his career, starting from November the 9th, 1837. The number two steam basin at the Royal Dockyards was opened by Her Majesty Queen Victoria, which Owen too would have attended. There, other duties, um, there were other duties such as that he oversaw, such as the grand opening of the new Clarence Esplanade in August 1848. And again, in 1848, he was engaged by the council to draft a plan for the extension of the Camber Docks and later supervised that construction. He worked closely with Dr. Engeldrew on the building of the Royal Portsmouth Hospital, and he also supported the development of railways and the public acquisition of a water supply. Now, we know a little bit about Owen and how, and you know, the stuff he's done for us in here in Portsmouth, but let's find out what you guys at home have been thinking, and you've been sending in your tweets throughout the show, so let's go to Ben, who has the latest from your tweets. Ben. Thanks guys, as you may recall at the start of the show we asked you guys to tweet us your questions even just any comments you had about the show and you've all been really busy sending us your comments so I've got some time now just to read out a few of them. Sam Greaves says, great show today, really enjoyed watching. Nicola Roberts has added that by saying, great show today, I've lived in Portsmouth for two years and never even heard of Thomas Ellis Owen. I'm glad now that I know a little bit about him. 
We just got to say it's brilliant that you guys are enjoying the show. You know, we think it's really important that people know a little bit about somebody who's done so much for our city. Emma Huskins has asked, do you know where I can buy the book from? Yep, definitely. If you check out the website, www.thomasellisowen.co.uk, you can find everything you need to find out about him there. As always, we love hearing from you guys. We really do. But unfortunately, that's it for me. It's back to Carl and Ollie in the studio. Uh, thank you, Ben. It really looks like you guys are enjoying the show. So thanks for getting in touch. And remember to keep them coming in by tweeting us at Pride of Portsmouth. Now, I'd say we've shown you a lot of interesting stuff about Owen, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, it is getting late in the show, but I think we've got enough time to squeeze in one last question for you viewers. What did cause Thomas Ellis Owen's death? Was it suicide? Car accident? Or a heart attack? Right, I'm going to go first on this one. I'm going to completely rule out car accident. Did they have cars back That's then? why I'm ruling it out. I don't <laughs> think they did. Well, I'm going for a, I'm going to go for a mysterious suicide Ooh, death. Ooh, mysterious suicide death. Okay, I'm going to go for heart attack. Um, let's find out what the answer the is. Heart attack, oh. yes! <laughs> Come on, get in. That's 2-1 two two one one. to Ollie. Well done, Ollie. Uh, just to clear things up, I'm not celebrating <laughs> the fact that he died from a heart attack. I'm just <laughs> celebrating that I won the quiz. Just in case you got the wrong uh, impression. Right. Uh, we're now going to go back to Sue Pike, who talks to us about the research of the book that she's written about Thomas Ellis Owen. I decided it would be a good idea to have a celebration of the 200th anniversary of Thomas Ellis Owen's birth, um, which would take place in 2004. At that time, we thought he was born in 1804. Actually, he was born in 1805, but we hadn't done any research at that point. So I raised some heritage lottery funding, set up a committee um, and a research group and um, asked local people at a public meeting if anybody wanted to be involved and lots of people did. And um, we had a festival in 2004 to celebrate course where in the first year you do kind of quite a lot of um, topics we I, I kind of suggested that people you know go away and they do they study lots of different kind of topics in whichever way they plead so they could go and look through local archives or they could look through newspapers um, or they could try to track down family relatives in whichever way they wanted to do it they could do it um, in the second year because we did have three years actually in the second year um, I kind of honed in a little bit more and asked them to do things in a more kind of in-depth way so um, maybe they would look through the newspapers in a more structured way or um, they would try to find out about properties in a more structured way um, uh, so that and then in the third year we completely tightened up and um, we we had a few things that we needed to find out at that point and we kind of targeted those things um, and I think one of those things actually was where he was buried at the because at the time we didn't know that and we'd been going around the houses but there were various kind of things that we hadn't done so we tightened up and we did those and we managed to find out that he was actually buried um, under what is now the lawn at, in St James's Churchyard. It just seemed like a good idea at the time actually. I can't honestly say. I haven't actually done I, I am a I, I'm a researcher. Um, and at that time, I was working for the University of Portsmouth, but um, I wasn't, hadn't done historic research. But um, one thing led to another, and um, it kind of seemed like a good idea, <laughs> which sounds crazy. But I think sometimes, um, sometimes people aren't you. You tend to always think that people are, you know, solid academics, and, and they've got to, you know, they have a kind of lifetime calling. But um, it was just a sequence of events, really, that um, led to me having this idea, which seemed like a good idea at the time. My husband said that, you know, I didn't have much on that year. <laughs> I think probably it was right, really. <laughs> uh, thank you. That was a brilliant Sue Pike there again. You know, it's the cat's gone missing. I know, he's off yeah. for a walk. Isn't he? I sent a message to it. He's going to come join us and join us on our <laughs> sofa here in the studio. Uh, anyway, sadly, that's all the time we've got for today. But I hope that we've taught you uh, a bit about a historical figure who had a great impact on how we see Portsmouth today. And if you want to find out more about Thomas Ellis Owen, you can check out the official website at www.thomaslsowen.co.uk. Yeah, make sure you give that site a visit. Uh, well, Carl, I feel we've learned a lot today. Absolutely. I think uh, every time I walk down Palmerston Road now, I'll uh, see St. Jude's Church and I'll know a bit about the man who built it, yeah. Thomas Ellis Owen. Uh, indeed. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us. That's it from both of us. Goodbye. <laughs>